am going to be starting off proceedings. And I'm just going to try and set a bit, provide a bit of a scene setter here for uh, the evening and then let the experts take over with respect to their particular areas uh, of knowledge and skill. Another disclaimer, just in case, keep my compliance department happy. And this is what we're going to very quickly look at, the global backdrop. UK dividends I'm going to focus on particularly, a little look at buybacks, some useful tests, which have also come in useful today, intriguingly with respect to a couple of stocks, and then some conclusions. So the global backdrop, well, this isn't going to take an awful lot of imagination for you to work out, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But interest rates after a lengthy period at record lows and a false start in terms of the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England trying to get rates up a couple of years ago, interest rates are creeping up, at least in the UK and the US. The US is both the US is now pricing in something like a 3% plus interest rate for the end of 2022. The Bank of England, something like maybe two and a half percent. And markets, at least for the moment, seem to resign that tighter monetary policy is coming even if the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan don't seem to be in quite such a rush as yet refusing to join the charge to tighten monetary policy. And that, of course, in some cases doesn't mean just interest rates, but quantitative tightening in an attempt to reverse quantitative easing. The Fed has poured on about $5 trillion worth through QE in the, in the last two or three years. The Bank of England more or less doubled its quantitative easing program. They're now looking to try and extricate themselves from that stimulus and run it down as best they can. As a result, bond yields are responding. I don't want to belabor this point because we've got a fixed income expert in Reese coming on next. But again, we can see bond yields are rising. Even the Bank of Japan's 10-year Japanese government bond yield is pushing 0.25%, heavens above. The German bond yield has gone back positive. And we can see that the US yield has, has, has galloped higher, has as the UK one, with some knock-on effects. So that, for example, the US 30-year mortgage yield is now above five and a half percent for the first time in some considerable period of time. And now the question is, does that start to have a knock on effect, for example, upon the housing market and a key plank of the US economy? So you may already be seeing the bond market do central banks job for them in terms of tightening. Of course, Reese may now be intrigued by these bond yields and think that they're more attractive than they were previously. We'll see what he's got to say about that later. Now, this is all stemming down to this change in interest rate momentum. These slides were prepared a few days ago to give our compliance department time to get them read and everything nice. And then Lisa and her expert team, everything nicely formatted. Uh, we've now gone from, I think, 90 odd interest rate increases on this slide to 117 rate rises in 2022, just three cuts from central banks. So I think we've all, almost exceeded the 2021 total already. There can be no clearer sign of how momentum has changed how central banks are now having to address the issue of inflation, whether they think the, the, the inflation has been caused by supply side problems, bottlenecks, people still working from home, ships crashing in the Suez Canal, whatever it happens to be. Or there'll be plenty of people out there as well who argue that the inflation is the result of central bank policy and government largesse and too much stimmy at the same time that supply has been restrained. And equally, we can argue there are all exogenous factors at work, the war in Ukraine, the expected recovery in oil, and now even some signs of protection have been areas like commodity, where India is now and Argentina are withholding wheat exports, Malaysia and Indonesia palm oil exports and so on, further muddying the waters. And there's one thing that we know that central banks can do, which is print money. One thing they can't do is print oil, wheat, corn, gas or anything else. So how much that how suitable their policies are to some of these dilemmas is an interesting question. And again, I won't belabor this too much with, with Reese coming up next. But as bond yields go up, bond prices go down, just as the same with an equity. And you have seen some pretty stunning reversals in some of the key bond benchmark indices. Um, again, so I'm sure Reese will explain duration in all of its glory when we get around to his slides. So that's the global context. What does this mean for UK equities? Traditionally seen as a pretty healthy source of equity income. And at the moment, if the analysts' forecasts are any good, then that maxim still probably pretty much holds true. So again, when we were sat here a year ago, we were talking about a huge rally in dividends as in dividend payments as FTSE 100 firms having prepared for the worst and hoped for the best in 2020 with cuts to capital investment, headcount, accepting furlough money and slashing their dividends and cancelling share buybacks. Well, maybe things didn't quite work out as badly as they all feared. They are able to quickly start restarting payments in 2021 and even pushing through catch-up payments. So you see a big rebound in 2021 payments. We're looking for a further modest increase in 2022 to around 
£80 billion sterling. That's enough for a dividend yield of just under 4% on the current market cap on the FTSE 100. Not as exciting as it was when the UK 10-year government bond yield was virtually zero, but still not too bad. Although, again, now we have inflation to counter when that's running at 6 7 8%, depending on whether you look at CPI, CPIH or RPI. But nevertheless, a useful tool in your armory to be harvesting that yield and boosting total returns, as we'll see shortly. We're not quite forecast to get back to the 2018 peak of around £83 billion even next year. And we'll look at why that might be in a minute. But certainly first up, a 4% forecast yield from UK equities at least gives you some chance of combating the evils of inflation and protecting your wealth. Now, the mix is very, very important for UK equities. It's one reason why there will be bears out there or sceptics who say that UK equities deserve to be cheap. They do look cheap on you know, 12, 13 times forward earnings compared to a derated US market on 17, 18 times earnings uh, and with the 4% yield. Because the mix, you could argue, is, is pretty uh, volatile, in some ways very difficult to forecast. Mining, oil and gas, well, commodity prices we know can be very volatile. And financials, well, they've been you know, serial underperformance for a very long period of time. And so, and then you have a number of plodders, where at least you know, the, the, the forecasts are, are relatively straightforward, touch wood, barring regulatory interference, but the growth clearly isn't very exciting. So a bit of a combination of the, you know, the, the, in, the unforecastable the impenetrable and the indigestible, you could argue, with, with, with commodities, financials, and then plodders. Um, so that may be why the UK market is cheap. But at the moment, also right now, it, it does help to explain why the, where the yield is coming from and, and why that yield is as high as it is. Some investors will be skeptical and demanding a high yield as compensation for perceived risks. Some will be steering clear because of environmental, social, and governance concerns. They just don't like companies that drill holes in the Earth's crust. And some will be skeptical as to whether the current strength in mining uh, in, in commodities, whether metal or oils, uh, is sustainable. So you could argue, well, that there's a 4% yield there for a good reason. Some will be very happy to embrace that. And again, it's very much a matter of any of you doing your own homework to see which you feel fits best with your worldview and your personal uh, income or capital gain requirements. The other way to look at this is just look at the top 10 stocks. I mean, basically, these 10 companies between them chuck out between what two thirds and 70 percent of forecast FTSE 100 dividends for 2022. So if you're looking at UK equities for individual stocks, maybe a fund, or even if you're looking at following the UK market through a passive fund, an ETF or a tracker, these are the 10 names you'd really better understand because they're certainly from an income perspective, they're driving again two thirds to 70 percent of your total dividend payments in 2022. Again, some of you may decide, thank you, but no thank you from an environmental concern element because, uh, angle because of the predominance of, of, of drillers, oils and miners. Some of you may be concerned to see you know, a couple of banks in there, given that they've been you know, not exactly the most reliable people over the last 10 or 15 years when it comes to dividends. There's been some fairly swinging cuts. Some of you may be reassured to see you know, a revived, a rejuvenated AstraZeneca uh, and, and GlaxoSmithKline as it breaks itself up and attempts to you know, stimulate its earnings growth. So, Again, it's very much horses for courses in what fits best with your long-term strategy, target return, time horizon, and appetite for risk. That's something that only you can know, but when you assess the UK market for income, you really need to do your research on these 10 names, whether you're looking at individual stocks, actively run collectives, or passives. Now, this has been a bit of a new wrinkle in the last you know, 12 or 15 months, I certainly, for one, would, you know, I'll be quite honest, wouldn't have expected the sort of buyback bonanza that we've seen in the last year back in 2020 when companies were you know, effectively hiding under a rock and just hoping that the world would, 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 would slow down as the pandemic ripped around the world. But buybacks are back. And in fact, after the recent announcement for the, for the second quarter from BP, some uh, buybacks from Next and a uh, 100 newcomer Endeavour Mining, we actually now have a forecast, or in fact, Presuming that companies follow through on what they've said they'll do for 2022, then we actually have a record high FTSE 100 buyback figure penciled in for this year of around £37 billion. And I guess there's probably a possibly a chance we we'll move towards 40 if the oils again keep on getting stuck in in the second half of the year and possibly some of the miners and banks. So that is nicely supplementing overall returns. Again, you know, you're moving towards another sort of three and a half, four percent cash returns coming from buybacks there. 
And we also had quite a few special dividends in 2021, nothing as, as perhaps as glamorous as we've seen previously, but a few came in. Uh, so again, your overall cash return from the FTSE 100 this year is looking like it's coming in at around 120 billion pounds, knocking on for a cash return of dividends plus special dividends plus buybacks in the seven to eight percent range. And that does start to knock a big hole in those inflation figures, whether you look at CPIH, CPI or RPI, and at least perhaps give you again some sucker. Clearly, we therefore have to watch out for the mix of those forecasts. And again, are they reliable? And will any of those buybacks be cancelled as they were spectacularly in 2020? There's no indication of that yet, but at least looking at the sector mix, here we are now. You can have a look at where the key pressure points might be or where the key upside factors may be. Financials and oils leading the charge, surprise, surprise. Consumer staples not far behind, Diageo and Unilever in the vanguard there, for example. Um, and, and then financials led particularly actually by Aviva rather than necessarily just the banks. So yeah, those are the companies that you need to keep an eye on if you're looking at buybacks to supplement income that you have. And certainly I'm sure there'll be a few funds out there. Now buybacks aren't everybody's idea of a great time. I know that you know Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have got some pretty strict criteria for when they look at buybacks for, for Berkshire Hathaway owned companies. In the case four, you can argue, well, giving the, the money back to shareholders stops the company from doing something dumb with it, which is probably no bad thing rules out certainly the risk of a, a spectacular acquisition or an overpriced acquisition. If as a shareholder you don't sell, well then you have an enhanced stake and an enhanced share of the company's assets and its cash flow, entitling you to a bigger share of perhaps dividend payments further down the road. Uh, yes, managements often do use it as a sign of confidence and there are possible tax advantages in that buybacks will be charged as capital gains rather than dividends as income. Now there are objections and cases against from a retail investor point of view you don't always get involved in the buyback party the institutions tend to get first dibs more important just as importantly they do tend to be pro-cyclical companies tend to buy back shares when things are going very well when their shares have gone up and therefore may not be as cheap and they tend to, to pull down the, the hatches and the shutters when their shares have collapsed uh, and their shares are potentially very cheap which is what happened in 2020. So therefore you do sometimes have to question whether boardrooms are the most objective in this respect, particularly if they've got earning bonuses that are triggered by earnings per share, which can get a bit of a boost from a share buyback, uh, certainly when it's in, for example, if they borrow to fund those buybacks. And yes, some companies do do that. Uh, and using debt may look clever when debt costs nothing and interest rates are at rock bottom. It might not look quite so clever if interest rates rocket and your interest bill starts to rise pretty quickly. So again, from your perspective as an investor, you need to decide whether you think that buybacks fit with your strategy, the things that you like to see, and you'll work out whether you're in the for or against camp. So key tests for dividends and, and buybacks. Just, to do, just a little bit of, you know, if you are doing your own research, rather than leaving this to, you know, to, to crack fund managers like Matt on the equity income side, for example, then you, know, you clearly need to look at earnings cover, very crudely earnings per share divided by dividend per share. Yes, you can use the historic number, which might be safer than using a forecast. You can use the forecast if you can get your hands on them and they are available for free in certain areas or, or perhaps one more safe way of doing it is look at average earnings over a dividends over a 10-year period or a full cycle to see how the, the, the figure works out anything over two over a full cycle you feel pretty comfortable with uh, obviously you can then make allowances for certain types of companies consumer staples utilities where the cash flows are much more reliable at least in theory you can cut them a bit of slack you might also want to look at free cash flow cover, and we'll show you how to do that in a second. You do get some companies where earnings cover is a bit deceptive. Conto Global is a case in point. It received a takeover from bid from KKR, the private equity company today. Earnings cover looked dreadful, never anywhere near, but then when it was a utility, it had very heavy depreciation charges. And on a free cash flow cover basis, the dividend yield was actually pretty safe, and the dividend yield was 8%, or oh, safe as any emerging market power utilities. Uh, dividend yield could be and, and certainly KKR seems to have decided that that's too good to be true to turn down and, and they've piled in with a with a bid that's just slight premium to the IPO price of five years ago. Again you'd ideally look at that over a cycle perhaps and not just on a one to two year forecast basis and you would do that in the forecast of a 3D view. Most investors tend to pile into the profit and loss account first because that's what the companies show, that's often what their bonuses are triggered off. But it's cash flow that funds the dividends and it's the balance sheet that supports the whole edifice. So you really need to look at all three. And if anything, for safety's sake, balance sheet first, cash flow second, PL third. PL 
Sales can be bad. Cash. Profits can be made to look better than they really are. Balance sheets, uh-uh. Cash is pretty hard to fudge unless you're extremely determined. And on the balance sheet, don't just look at debt and cash. Check out pension liabilities, leases and contingent liabilities as well. And then look at the interest cover on top to make sure that you've got a full picture. Imperial Tobacco is a, is a Imperial Brands, wash my mouth out, is, is a good example. Haven't had a chance to adopt this slide for today's numbers. But again, this is one where actually on the face of it, free cash flow cover isn't too bad. Clearly, you have to take a long term view as to where smoking is going. And after a respiratory global virus, you might think only one way. And yes, stick volumes are falling. But right now, the company is proving able to offset falling stick volumes with increased prices owing to the price and elasticity of the product that they sell, which is tobacco. Again, environmental investors and social and governance screeners will walk right away in the opposite direction. Those who are a little um, less, I won't say scrupulous, uh, more interested in, in necessarily profit rather than principle, may decide that this free cash flow means that imperial brands yield is still worth a look, even if you still have to address the long tail of that cash flow, where you think it might be if there is indeed a move away from smoking due to regulatory and healthcare pressures. But that is a full way of looking at free cash flow cover and not just relying on uh, earnings per share because you're taking into account not just capital expenditure, but the bills that no company can avoid, tax, interest, leases. They have to be paid whether it's making a profit or not. It's those things that generally get companies in, in trouble, as was proven spectacularly with Carillion, a company that again on the face of it was paying a fat dividend yield. So by way of conclusion, I used this last year and I'm going to use it again, partly because the mood music has changed enormously over the last 12 months. 12 months ago, people were still, many market participants were still falling over themselves to buy US tech stocks and go with the herd. Rather, as Benjamin Graham warned about in, 19, in his 1934 book, Security Analysis, you know, why did the investing public turn its attentions from dividends, from asset values and from average earnings, not average earnings over a cycle? To transfer it to the earnings trend and where and, and chasing tech stocks, jam tomorrow stocks, and dare one say it cryptos and all sorts of other stuff. Well, they did it because the trend looked pretty strong in the short term, but where the cash asset backing, what the cash flow backing was, the asset backing was for those assets wasn't clear in 29. And judging by market action over the past few months, it's not that clear now either. So again, income has its role. And just to finish off with the maths, this is the FTSE all share on a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 year view. And by harvesting and reinvesting your dividends, the FTSE 100's total return outstrips that capital only when you buy, when you don't get any dividends at all, or you, or certainly you don't reinvest them. So the maths is still compelling over the very long run for equity income and particularly equity reinvestment. And you know, just, just to touch on those things that we've talked about there, where, where, which were hot and sweaty over the past couple of years, we'll just land that with a final question there. Are their powers starting to fade as interest rates rise, growth is repriced, and companies that can actually generate cash and have some pricing power, perhaps their merits are realized as being perhaps having been underestimated relative to the, the overestimation potentially of jam tomorrow stocks who are on a customer land grab, but didn't have a particularly clear path turning those into cash flow and profits down the road thank you very much for your time everybody i'd greatly appreciate it